Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us to note the release of Win Race Trump's Merit, How the Pursuit of Equity Sacrifices Excellence Destroys Beauty and Threatens Lives. I'm Brian Anderson. I'm the editor of City Journal. And it's my honor to introduce the book's author, Heather McDonald. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Heather is the Manhattan Institute's Thomas W. Smith Fellow. She's a contributing editor of City Journal, who has written for the magazine almost since its inception. And her byline appears regularly in the Wall Street Journal and many other leading publications. She's also the author of the bestsellers The War on Cops and The Diversity Delusion. Uh, just for kicks, I asked Chat G GTP who the most influential City Journal writers are, <laughs> and Heather's name headed the list. So. <laughs> I like that. I like that I -A AI. AI, <laughs> yes. Um, over the years, Heather's scrupulous and groundbreaking work has shed light on important trends in American life. Her new book brings relentless reporting to perhaps the most dangerous one yet, which is the equity craze that is threatening our scientific, cultural, and public institutions. In this new book, When Race Trump's Marriage, she details the rise of disparate impact ideology and its potential to do enormous harm to our society. Her book also represents a powerful defense of our civilizational inheritance. So we'll discuss all of that and more tonight. So Heather, let me start. So in the, in the wake of George Floyd's death in May 2020, activists heightened their cries for so-called racial equity and the proportional representation of races in American institutions and organizations. The press published countless stories about minorities' underrepresentation in various fields and firms corporations began to fall over themselves proclaiming their guilt in perpetuating racial inequity. Now driving this shift was the concept of disparate impact, which is really at the center of your book. So what is the core idea of disparate impact, and can you trace briefly its origins and how it's kind of metastasized in this post-Floyd uh, period? Thank you, Brian. And first of all, let me give a, a, I hate to use the phrase, but a trigger warning. Uh, I'm, I'm going to discuss things that are very uncomfortable to talk about. I'm talking about group averages in, in average skills, average behavioral, average cultural predilections. I'm not making any judgments about any individual within any particular racial group. Uh, there are thousands of individuals in this racial group or that racial group that outperform everybody else. Uh, we can't make any assumptions about individuals based on their membership in groups, but the discourse that is tearing down our civilization, that is tearing down meritocratic standards, is itself uh, couched in, in grotesque generalities, and it has to be answered uh, with certain observations about group performance. So, just please steal yourself for uh, some truths that are really taboo across our population. Uh, the idea of disparate impact is the idea that any standard, meritocratic in terms of academic skills that has a negative impact on certain minority groups, and above all on blacks, is by definition racist unless in the legal context it can be justified at a very high standard of business necessity. So for instance, if you've noticed for the last de several decades, there's been challenge after challenge to police entrance exams or firefighter exams. And the accusation always is these are racist exams for no other reason than blacks fail them at higher rates than whites. And so the assumption always is well, the, the exam is racist, the meritocratic standard is racist, throw out the test and lower standards until we get a standard that will not have a negative disparate impact. What is never allowed to be looked at and examined is what are the underlying average rates of academic skills. The, the standard is not itself racist. 
but now we're going around declaring any standard that has a disparate impact on blacks per se racist and we're throwing them out. Uh, this began initially in the context of employment, hiring. It was a way of expanding the civil rights laws beyond the requirement that you needed to intentionally discriminate. An employer needed to intentionally say, I don't want to hire qualified blacks. That is per se illegal and unconstitutional. Disparate impact arose because it was getting harder and harder to find employers that were intentionally discriminating against competitively qualified minorities. And so the new rule was, you could be completely colorblind as an employer, but if you're using a employment criterion that, that disqualifies blacks disproportionately, you got to get rid of it. And now that idea has leapt way beyond the, the judicial opinions, legal codes, and is simply the lens through which we judge all of our mainstream institutions. So this, this ideology is, as you document in the book, corrupting the sciences. Mm -hmm. um, this is the opening section of the book. It's, it's very alarming, and, and it's happening fast. Uh, so increasingly, diversity and equity criteria are ruling everything from grants and scholarships to government scientific appointments uh, to even how medicine is being practiced. Right. Merit is no longer the leading criterion in many of these situations. So I wonder if you could give an overview of this development uh, and what we stand to lose with the de-emphasis of merit in the sciences. Well, we're, we're putting both lives at risk with the insistence on pushing people ahead into medicine who are not competitively qualified, and we're also putting scientific research at risk. But here's an example of how the disparate impact analysis works. Uh, College seniors applying to medical school take something called the MCATs, the Medical College Admission Test. And those have a disparate impact on black students. Uh, blacks' MCAT scores are at, at the rock bottom. And so various medical schools now are deciding that for black students, they'll either waive the MCATs completely. Uh, that's a developing trend. For decades, they have been having two separate standards for admission. So blacks are admitted with MCAT scores that would be automatically disqualifying if presented by a white or Asian student. Uh, a black student with slightly below average MCATs and GPA has a nine times greater chance of admission to a medical school than a white student or Asian student. Again, these would be scores that would be disqualifying otherwise. The medical school licensing exam has gone pass-fail rather than being graded because, again, the, the licensing exam has a disparate impact on black medical students. It is used to screen students for some of the most competitive residencies during medical school. The schools have decided we would rather get rid of grades and the, and the actual medical uh, licensing body would rather get rid of grades and, dis and destroy our ability to actually rank students than give a completely colorblind, neutral test that has no racial bias in it, it's objective, it's computer graded, that has a disparate impact on blacks. Uh, the, the preferences never end. The pressure is enormous on schools to promote, to hire doctors based on race, to promote doctors based on race, to put them in the charge of medical research. And the pressure is also coming from national funding agencies. The National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, are now making race a more important qualification for receiving uh, medical grants than actual scientific qualification. Uh, if you want to get a grant for your Alzheimer's research lab or your neurology, a, a greater neurology lab, you have to show how your work affects and improves diversity and how your own lab is working to change the demographics of its, uh, of its research core. Now, frankly, I don't care who discovers the neurological pathways that are responsible for Alzheimer's. If that lab is all Chinese, if it's all female, if it's all black, if it's all white, I don't care. 
the only thing that matters is are these the most qualified scientists. But in the United States, and uniquely in the United States, we've made the decision that diversity is more important than meritocracy. Meanwhile, China uh, doesn't pay attention to identity politics, and it is racing full speed ahead, uh, trying to throw everything it's got at its most talented, mathematically inclined, and scientifically inclined students uh, without saying we have to pull down their capacity in order to, to make some uh, make sure that all groups end up at the same rate uh, at the end of the line. So that's science. Uh, the next major part of the book is on something very close to your heart, which is culture mm -hmm. uh, and the arts. So you describe the distortion and vilification of Western high culture by activists who see it now primarily as camouflage for a regime of racial discrimination and domination. Uh, I think what's most striking in reading your book, this part of the book, is the complicity of leading artistic in institutions in this kind of ongoing attack on our Western cultural inheritance. And this too, I think you would say, has accelerated since, since the George Floyd killing. Um, so, you know, maybe you could document a little bit what's been happening there as you do in the book. Yeah, it's just, it's stunning to me. If you're, if you're running an opera company or an orchestra, or you're Max Holain, the head of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, or James Rondeau, the head of the Art Institute of Chicago, you should be down on your knees in gratitude every day at your privileged existence to curate artistic traditions that are among the most sublime in world history, that allow the human being to escape his petty, narrow, pathetically ignorant self and, and expand into forms of consciousness and understanding that are so much greater than any of us could ever hope to experience, whether it's the, the Oresteia by Aeschylus, one of the great tragic trilogies of the, of the classical age of Athens. To, to read sends chills down your spine with its perception of the human thirst for vengeance and the, the transcendence of finally reaching a rule of law and, and a hope for justice. Or whether it's Renaissance poetry, pastoral poetry, or the the languor and eros of late Brahms piano music or Chopin nocturnes or the tragic catharsis that we get from the Bach St. Matthew Passion. These are works that none of us really deserve. And it turns out that the heads of our classical music organizations, our literature departments, our art museums really don't deserve them because they are going around telling the public, and what is most criminal is telling young people to hate these traditions on the pathetic grounds that they are came out of Europe, and thus, by definition, inevitably, were created by Caucasian people. That is the European tradition. Get over it. It is the past. We cannot change it. Europe was not 13% black. It probably still is not. To expect that the canon of classical composers should be 13% black, and if it's not, it's per se racist, is preposterous. Now, of course, there are fantastic black composers, but they arose much later in our tradition. But now you have Alex Ross, the, one of the leading classical music critics in the country, writing for The New Yorker, apologizing for himself being white and curating a tradition that is, he, as he puts it, blindingly white. He's a, he apologizes for white audiences. He apologizes for white donors. The other most important classical music critic in the country, Anthony Tomasini of The New York Times, has called for making orchestral additions, auditions color conscious so that musicians can be hired on the basis of race. Currently, they often start for several levels behind a screen so that the auditioners do not know the identity of, uh, 
of the performers. And as with all things in our di disparate impact obsessed world today, we have now decided that mechanisms that are inherently colorblind are themselves racist. And so this applies to the audition screen. It applies to red light cameras. A red light camera does not know who's driving uh, the car. But if red light cameras show us that in certain neighborhoods, blacks are running red lights or speeding at higher rates, then the camera is racist and will be thrown out. That is going on across the country. So you have museums now erecting wall labels that teach their viewers to see the great Baroque masterpieces of the Dutch Golden Age, the still lifes of translucent grapes and lemons and silver that is shining in the light, to see those still lifes as colonialist. Because at the same time as they were being painted, uh, Holland and the Netherlands had colonial territories. And, and so you have this massive mea culpa that is being promulgated by people whose only obligation in life is to share this beauty and to tell young people, come to my museum, listen to this music. If you die without hearing these works, you will have lived a poorer life than you could otherwise have lived. But everything now is being filtered through the completely specious lens of racial inequity. You began to talk about the question of law and order, which was also discussed in the book. That gets into a public policy question. You describe, and you have described and written about this in the past, the disconnect between what residents of minority neighborhoods have in the past said they want in law enforcement and the, the relentless anti-policing rhetoric of many legislators and activists. And you found uh, that uh, blacks and other minorities have in the past anyway appreciated uh, visible proactive policing. Uh, in fact, they've called for police to take more stringent measures in their communities. I remember you used to go to community meetings mm -hmm. in, in the Bronx and elsewhere where that would be what was discussed. I wonder if that disconnect continues to hold in the post-George Floyd era and you know, more broadly, what influence has the disparate impact analysis had on public safety? Well, disparate impact analysis on public safety has been disastrous, absolutely disastrous. Uh, the narrative is, is that colorblind, constitutional, law enforcement that has a disparate impact on black criminals is per se racist. Uh, and, and you have the, the redoubled falsehood that black parents are right to fear that their children will be killed by a cop or by a white person every time they step outside. The Joe Biden ran on this during the pres uh, his presidential campaign. He said it before, the day before he was inaugurated. He said it as an inaugural speech. He said it constantly. It is a constant theme that is a falsehood. Uh, blacks have a tragically higher rate of death by gun homicide. Blacks between the ages of 10 and 24 die of gun homicide at 25 times the rate of whites between the ages of 10 and 24. That is a civil rights problem that you would think that civil rights activists would care about. They will not talk about it. Because if they were to talk about it honestly and look at the actual data, what we know from the victims of witnesses to shootings, non-fatal shootings and the witnesses to fatal shootings, is that that black death by gun homicide rate is caused almost exclusively by black criminals. You could take out all police shootings of black men today, you could take out all white shootings of black men today, it would have virtually no effect on the black death by gun homicide rate. And yet, we are blaming the cops, we're blaming the criminal law enforcement. Everything that you see that you may have been puzzling over in the post-George Floyd era 
why are these prosecutors not prosecuting trespass, turnstile jumping, resisting arrest, which is the most appalling thing uh, not to prosecute because it's basically saying to cops, you know, open season on you guys and we don't, as prosecutors, we don't care. We're decriminalizing resisting arrest. Why are they not prosecuting uh, gun possession, drug possession, prostitution, disorderly conduct, loitering? It is all driven by disparate impact. It's all you need to know to understand our world today. The reason that Kim Fox in Chicago, that Alvin Bragg in New York, that George Gascon, the, the worst Soros prosecutor in the whole country, has decided to put entire categories of crime off limits to his district attorneys is because enforcing them have a disparate impact. Not because that enforcement is racist, but because the black crime rate is so much higher. I have spent a lot of time in high crime neighborhoods talking to the residents there. I go to police community meetings and I talk to the good law abiding people who deserve the same freedom from fear as residents of Park Avenue. And what I've heard again and again is we want more police. I smell marijuana in my hallway. Why can't you do something about it? They're smoking weed on the, at the club that I see outside the window. Why can't you arrest those people? Why are you allowing kids to hang out by the hundreds on the corner fighting? Whatever happened to truancy laws? People want proactive enforcement that are living with the effects of depolicing and the disparate impact crusade. They never get heard. It is a very bizarre thing. If you were a civil rights activist and we're going to do sort of a Rawlsian experiment of like imagine before we know the actual reality of things, you could imagine a civil rights activist taking the side of black victims rather than black criminals. One even might have expected that because black victims are the ones that are, whose lives are being destroyed. But all our civil rights activists have taken the side of black criminals. They say that they would rather not put more criminals in prison where they cannot continue preying on elderly black ladies who are terrified to go into their building lobby to pick up their mail when, when kids are there trespassing, smoking weed and selling drugs. They would rather allow those good, honest, law-abiding people to just have to figure things out for themselves than make arrests and increase uh, any racial disparities that we have in prison. And that, to me, is a very perverse uh, decision. It, it sort of looks to me at this point like the only people who care about black lives are A, the police and white conservatives, because the only people who are talking about crime before the 2022 elections were basically conservative news outlets. But they were accused for, for, for doing racist dog whistles. If you talk about black victims, you're a racist. It's a very curious thing. I can tell you, if, black cons if white conservatives stop paying attention to crime, nobody's going to pay attention. The New York Times sure as hell doesn't give a damn about black victims. The only black victims they ever care about are those that are killed by a cop, and those are very small. In 2021, there were six unarmed blacks killed by police officers, fatally shot by police officers. A police officer was 400 times more likely to be killed by a black male than an unarmed black was to be killed by a police officer. But those are the data that are not allowed into the public discourse. Racial preferences in hiring and academic admissions, another theme of your book, clearly diminish opportunities for disfavored or unfavored groups. So policies designed to boost the prospects of black and to some extent Hispanic applicants uh, often disadvantage whites and, and Asians with, who have higher scores or, or often better credentials who are vying for the same positions. Uh, you know, disparate impact adherents dismiss this kind of racial rebalancing act as necessary mm -hmm. to advance the life chances of underprivileged minorities. Uh, but you, you would have to say this is wildly unfair to the newly disadvantaged, we could call them and a sure way to perpetuate and increase racial tensions mm -hmm. over time. So that would be one question. 
you know, what, what is the reaction going to be to the perpetuation of these policies? And, and then looking at the policies themselves, how do racial preference policies have an impact on their intended beneficiaries? It's not always a positive thing. Right. Uh, Asians are getting radicalized on this because they are screwed the most. Uh, the, the standards for getting in if you're Asian into selective schools get higher and higher because the numbers are of the, that are allowed to be admitted in order to set aside spots for the, dis, the, for the racial preference beneficiaries get smaller and smaller. So they have to, you know, the, the schools that purport to say, well, the SATs are racist, if they haven't, if they haven't banned SATs completely, they are calculating Asians' scores out to the 0.0001% decimal. You know, you have to be, play not just, it's no longer probably enough to play the violin and the piano any longer. You probably better add the bassoon. You probably also better be really good at baseball and, uh, you know, get the math Olympiad. Um, so there's starting to be a reaction. We see this especially at the high school level where various exam schools that are uh, trying to create environments for people that are the most academically uh, motivated, like Stuyvesant City in, in Stuyvesant School in New York City, that has a colorblind, objective, computer graded exam to get in. Uh, it's, I think, 70% Asian. And there's decades of pressure to say, get rid of the exam, start admitting by race. It hasn't yet. There's been sort of tweaking. But other places have gotten rid of their exams. Lowell High School in San Francisco uh, was also predominantly Asian. And they went to a lottery system instead of the exam. Not surprisingly, the first year after the lottery was instituted, uh, the rates of Ds and Fs went up 300%. Uh, Thomas Jefferson High School in Virginia also has gotten rid of its neutral, colorblind, completely objective admissions tests because they want to engineer greater racial proportionality. Asians are starting to get radicalized on this. Um, the, the equity argument against racial preferences has, has been the favored one for conservatives for years, that this is reverse discrimination. It's not fair to people who have done nothing. You know, Asians are not responsible for slavery. And frankly, none of us today are either, unless you do believe in the inheritance of acquired characteristics. And we all somehow now are bearing the genes of, of, um, and, and, and responsibility of slaveholders. And let me also put in an aside here. Our racial history is appalling. It is sickening. We were a white supremacist country. We were an apartheid country. Whites treated blacks with excruciating cruelty, contempt, gratuitous nastiness until very recently. We are not that country today. We are not. As incredible as it would have been to expect that even by the 1960s, there is not a single mainstream institution today that is not twisting itself into knots to hire and promote as many black applicants as possible. If you are, I would like to know any black student applying to a college today who's going to put down his race as white because he thinks that's going to help him get in. <laughs> to the contrary, if your white heterosexual male son can get away with putting his race down as black, he'd be better off doing so. <laughs> so um, the argument has traditionally been couched against racial preferences that it's unfair to whites and Asians. And I get that. But as far as I'm concerned, and that's what equal protection jurisprudence and the, 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 the case before the Supreme Court that is challenging Harvard's preferences and the University of North Carolina's preferences, will probably use the same old tired equal protection jurisprudence of strict scrutiny. And it, it's, all, it's got so many fictions in it, it makes me want to throw up. I hope, and this is very unlikely, that they actually overturn racial preferences on a pragmatic ground, which is something known as mismatch, which is that preferences do not do their beneficiaries any favor. And let me take it out of the race context and put it into the sex context. If MIT admitted me, 
with 600s on my math SATs, and I'm not going to tell you what they actually were, and I'm not sure I remember them, but I sort of do. Uh, and I had 600 on my math SATs on an 800-point scale, and all of my peers that were not the so-called beneficiaries of preferences had 800s on their math SATs. I am going to flunk my freshman calculus class, and I'm going to struggle if I even stick with a STEM field uh, throughout my class. And of course, MIT's diversity bureaucracy will tell me, well, you're the victim of misogyny. You're in an anti-female environment, whereas the reality is, no, I'm in an environment for which I'm not competitively qualified. There is no shame in going to a second tier school. Boston College and Boston University provide perfectly good, serviceable educations. If, if I'd been admitted, instead of propelled, propelled above my <coughs> capacity at that time to a school for which I was competitively qualified and where I shared my peers' qualifications, I would do perfectly well. The same happens with blacks. They are not helped by putting, they are the, bearing the almost unique burden of having to compete in environments for which they're not competitively qualified, and the results speak for themselves. Law schools employ vast racial preferences. Here's what happens at the end of the first year of law school. First year law grades are all colorblind. They are anonymous. Teachers don't know who's writing the blue books. 51% of black law students at the end of their first year in law school end up at the bottom 10% of their class. Two thirds of black law students at the end of their first year of law school end up at the bottom 20% of their class. The, the gaps never close. This is not something that is a good way of reducing racial stereotyping, but it is also not a good way to increase the number of black lawyers because the number of blacks who fail the bar six times in a row and never pass it is six times higher than whites because they, black students have been put at the disadvantage of being in law schools where they are not competitively qualified. Of course, blacks should become lawyers and go to law school. They should go under the same conditions as everybody else and not have this burden of the preference catapult that makes it harder to compete. So I hope that somebody has put in an amicus brief to the Supreme Court and, and Clarence Thomas or John Roberts will say, this is the thing that I want the public to understand about this preference regime that we've been living with since Bakke in 1978 uh, that has not just destroyed meritocratic standards, but has been an actual disability for the people who purport to benefit from it. Uh, those who um, speak honestly and stand up to this regime, this disparate impact regime, um, they, they risk losing their livelihood yeah. and social standing, at least in some cases. And so your book includes interviews with several employees of prestigious scientific and cultural institutions. They vehemently oppose racial preference, preferences. They see uh, what, what you've described going on, but they're unwilling to express their sentiments yeah. publicly. And you can understand that because of the fear of consequences. So I, I wonder, you know, does opposition within these institutions to defend merit, uh, do, does someone who do the, does this become a martyr? Is, is that their only choice, or are there other ways to fight back against this? Yeah, I asked, as I was finishing this book, I asked an oncologist who had been directed by the head of the Natural Cancer Institutes that give something out called the Outstanding Investigator Awards. And these are awards that the federal government gives to the most cutting edge cancer researchers that are doing high risk science. In other words, it has a high risk of total failure. It may be based on a theory that is so off the wall that it's, it's not ever going to produce any results. But if it does produce results, wow, um, this, is, this has a possibility to be absolutely paradigm shattering. And uh, these investigator awards are very lucrative. They uh, exempt uh, oncology researchers from 
you can basically take six years off from teaching in order to just focus exclusively on this fight. Uh, and I talked to an oncologist who lives to cure cancer. That's all he wants in his life. And he'd been notified by the head or the deputy director of the National Cancer Institutes say, the Inf Outstanding Investigator Awards have not been going so well recently. They're not diverse enough. Please broaden the criteria for nominations and send us more diverse candidates so that we can award more diverse awards. Not a word about meritocracy. This was not about the scientific qualifications that you've been sending us are inadequate. We want a higher tier of scientists. No, that was not what the game was about. It was about lower your standards so that we can show diverse faces when we have our class of, of wardees. And I said, when are you guys going to stand up against this? This is sickening. And he said, we need our jobs. We want our jobs. Uh, if we stand up, we will be crushed. Uh, the, those who have done so are now complete pariahs. The whole system, it's going to take 50 years. It's going to have to collapse completely and be rebuilt from the ground up. And I, I feel for him. I would say people in my position who are not in canceling institutions, and thank you, the Manhattan Institute, for not canceling me yet. <laughs> we'll see uh, when the Twitter starts coming, fall, you know, coming in and what C-SPAN has to say about this, I don't know. Um, but those of us who are more insulated have an absolute obligation to give the, the facts that explain disparate impact. I am not going to be cowed into silence. It's too late. It's too late. It's all coming down. Uh, people like us have to speak up. I, in the book, you know, I'm, I, I'll, I'll give you an honest description here of what like writers and speakers are under. You're supposed to always have a positive solution. Even though I'm a pessimist and I don't necessarily feel very optimistic, but, but audiences want to believe there's hope and there's something they can all rally behind. So I'm scratching my head and what can I do with a solution? Because it frankly looks to me a very tough nut to crack. So I came up with an idea of an institution that would be uh, apart from any particular institution like somebody's medical school uh, or somebody's tech startup uh, that would be ready to snap into action whenever there is a amazingly, surprisingly courageous scientist like Norman Wang, an electrophysiologist at the University of Pittsburgh, who ran a lab, had, had, had uh, all sorts of students that he was advising, top in his field. He dared write an article in a scientific journal saying racial preferences in medicine are not working out. We've tried them. They're not working out. We're lowering our standards. We're not helping advance medicine. We're not helping the students. He was completely canceled. He was taken off his post. He was stripped of his research capacity. He's not allowed to have any contact with students. This is what happens. People are destroyed by telling the truth. And so I thought maybe if we could have an organization that would have at their fingertips data on the academic skills gap, Put them out there. Put them out there on the crime gap so that when the police are being vilified and, and we have now a total recruiting and retention crisis, there is hardly a big city police department that is anywhere close to the number of officers it needs in order to fight crime, even if the prosecutors were willing to actually bring a case against a shoplifter or a thief. But they don't have the officers to make those arrests because there's been such a post-George Floyd flight from the profession. So if we could have an organization that would give the data to support this, that's one hope. Otherwise, all I can say is, is courage, refuse to apologize, refuse to back down. Uh, because at this point, I believe there is a good argument to be made for racial etiquette. And as I say, these are uncomfortable things to talk about. Nobody wants to hear about it. But the time for racial etiquette is over. Because as long as racism remains the only allowable explanation for racial disparities in a medical school, in an Alzheimer's lab, 
in a classical music orchestra, in a bank, in your corporation, in a newspaper. As long as racial disparities remain the only allowable explanation, it's all coming down. And we have to be able to fight back with the actual explanation, which are these tragic disparities that we can all agree need to be fixed, and we all have different explanations or solutions for fixing them, but they need to be solved at the core spot, at the family, at the, at the earliest ages of childhood, to socialize children, to get rid of the anti-acting white ethic, which penalizes many black students who are doing their homework, who are taking their textbooks home, who believe that they can meet standards, who want to learn, and if they are criticized by their peers for acting white, that's something that is very hard to overcome. That has to change. But, but 22 years down the line, saying, well, the solution for this is to get rid of standards of medical competence or engineering or chemistry and have double standards of admission, that is not how we solve it. And we have to start explaining why our institutions are not at present racially proportionate. We can hope that they will be with a more honest, the only way they will be is with a more honest discourse. And it is paternalistic, it is condescending to lower standards rather than saying we know that everybody can meet those standards. Thank you. I think we uh, would like to open it up to the floor and uh, Please wait for the microphone. Left about 15 minutes for, for questions. So we'll, uh, we'll start up front here with the gentleman at the end here. Just wait for the microphone, please. Uh, Mark Castorino, professor at Rutgers University. And before I, uh, when does Trump's name have to show up there? <laughs> when is what? Trump's name have to show up. <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. It's, Could it's have come no up, problem. yeah. I think okay. we thought about that, but decided I'm what the hell. I'm probably the only brown person in the audience, but I want to say something about where merit trumps race. I'm an Indian, and my country was ruled for 200 years by the white man from across the seas. In 1947, we got our independence. As a people and as a nation, we refused to look back, but decided to forge ahead. Today, three of my countrymen who went to the same university that I went to run the three of the largest companies in the world, Microsoft, Google, and IBM. Yep. Another two Indians became governors of two southern states in this country, and another Indian is now prime minister of Britain. The thing is now, my advice to uh, Harvard University and uh, the New York Times, stop this narrative about race, okay? It doesn't help the people you're trying to help. Right. Take the message from the Indians who made it on merit, not on race. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they have, a, they have a hard problem with the white privilege conceit when Asians are whooping everybody's ass. You know, uh, so, but of course, you know, we, know, we know all of the rhetorical twists and turns about that of, well, they're white adjacent, and no, they're not. They're not. Uh, you know, they, it, is, it is academic effort. It is family culture. If you, you cannot learn if you're not in school, the black truancy rate is very high. Nobody can actually, at this point, the, the learning to read, the student has to do it himself. Uh, and racializing this does not help. The effort has to come from within. And, it, and if effort is made, we are an open society. We are waiting with welcome, open arms. All right, let's uh, move to the back of the room. So uh, I'll go to the left, uh, way in the back there. I can just see your hand. Hi, Heather. Enjoyed your talk. Generally agree with your thesis, but it sounded like you were assuming that there is necessarily a problem with our institutions not being racially proportionate. And 
That's not at all obvious to me. It seems to me that it's inevitable that there will be racial disparities, even significant ones in some institutions and not in others. And that could just simply be a reflection of different cultural norms and preferences of different ethnic and cultural groups in our society. Yeah, that's true. I guess I'm having to focus on uh, the charge that racial disparities in institutions is per se a sign of racism somewhere. You know, they, it's very hard. There's this, at this point, systemic racism is like phlogiston. It's like this vaporous thing that we just have to believe is out there, and nobody can really point to where it is exactly. Um, but I guess rather than just saying, well, we will have disparities, get over it, I'm, I feel like I, my engagement at this point is to explain those disparities. Uh, and, and then it's a slightly different argument. In one sense, we're making the same argument, which in light of the academic skills gaps and the behavior gaps in crime, yes, of course we're going to have lack of racial proportionality. Um, so the assumption that there would be equal outcomes is only valid uh, if, if cultures at this point were different. But I can tell you the Asian culture, the tiger mom culture, puts everything else to shame. And if you juxtapose that to the inner city culture, the behavioral disparities are so great, it astounds me that apparently my good friends on the left actually believe that the best explanation for the lack of disparities is racism and not what is quite empirically provable about how the home cultures differ. Um, woman in the, uh, yes, you, yes. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Just wait for the mic, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree, and everybody agrees, that the election of these woke DAs and mayors um, affect minority communities even greater than white communities in major cities. But how do you explain Johnson winning in Chicago when, um, you know, there, there's no, they were both, de both candidates were Democrats. One was law and order, one was criminal coddling. How do you explain that? Yeah. Thank you. It's, um, and it, in fact, he, got the biggest vote in the highest crime precincts and areas. I think, I, I mean, I'm really presuming here, and I do this with great trepidation, but you've asked me, but it is, it is at some point, it is not for me to uh, pronounce on black voting behavior, but it, it would seem that there is a conflict you know, I've, I've made it a mission to give voice to the people that the New York Times refuses to listen to that really are desperate for more police protection. Well, are they voting? Why aren't they voting for the better candidate? I, I, I think that they're, I don't, again, this is, it is presumptuous of me to hypothesize, but I, I will offer a hypothesis, that there is a conflict uh, within blacks, there's a tradition and you, as you say, they're both Democrats, uh, but there is something perhaps seductive about the racism narrative that a lot of voters are not willing to give up yet. And Brandon Johnson is, was peddling the argument that the police are racist. It's also, maybe it's attractive that, oh, more services are the solution. I'm skeptical of that. Uh, maybe that appealed to people. But it is, it, it, I would say that the conservative safe harbor argument, which I may be guilty of uh, perpetuating sometimes myself, which is to too, too starkly say, well, the polls do show, you know, if you do Quinnipiac polls routinely show, if you ask blacks, do you want more broken windows quality of life enforcement, they will say yes at higher rates than whites, and yet, they will also vote for the anti-cop candidate. And for the, if there's a racial component in that he was a black candidate, I think that's the elephant. That's true too. Uh, these are all very difficult things, and it's hard for white people to talk about it. There are some great black leaders out there, 
uh, and I hope that they get more attention and get more followers because the race hustle is, is seductive, it's a narcotic, it has been working, but it's got to stop now. And, and frankly, I'm going to racialize this, and again, excuse me for violating racial etiquette. I know these are extremely raw matters, but I, I've, I'm fed up. I've seen too much happening to the things I love. We can't allow ourselves to be browbeaten by the race hustle any longer. We have to believe in equal opportunity, in standards. We cannot continue maligning colorblind meritocratic standards. Uh, this gentleman here with the tie, just wait for a uh, the, the microphone, please. It's coming. Many of my clothes. Um, thank you for a great talk. Thank you. Uh, before I ask my question, uh, I'm a retired associate professor of medicine and oncology. Uh, and what you spoke about hit me. During the COVID epidemic, the initial data was that it's occurring more in African Americans than in Caucasians. Anyone who's ever done any clinical research would automatically look at subgroup analysis. You would look, compare affluent whites to affluent blacks and poor whites to poor blacks. You would have quickly picked up that it's due to affluence. Poor people are huddled together in their apartments, and we probably would have saved a lot of lives doing the subgroup analysis, which for some reason was not done. I actually wrote a letter to the Wall Street Journal, even though they had published other letters of mine. They didn't publish that. So with this sort of silliness, we lo I think we lost lives during COVID. My question to you, however, is what do we do about it? You know, these people like Professor Wang in Pittsburgh, when they're fired, there should be a fund to yeah. get good lawyers for them to sue the institutions. And once these people get hurt and knocked with fines, they may back off. When you get their pocketbook, they may start listening. Mm -hmm. Until they get hurt, they're not going to listen to anyone. Yeah. And that's probably the cheapest way of doing it, getting them good legal representation to find out why they were fired. Mm -hmm. And no one, to my knowledge, has done that. So can you answer that? Has anyone done that or thinking of it? Yes, there's some lawsuits going. Timothy Jackson at the University of North Texas has been run off the job because he uh, ran, he, he headed a music journal of musicology uh, uh, built around a Austrian music theorist named uh, Schenker that has been very in influential in the United States. There's a, a black musicologist at uh, Hunter College here in New York City, part of the CUNY system, that has the most absolutely insane theory that because Schenker talks about hierarchies in tonal value and, and it is in making sort of hierarchical analysis of music, that this is about race, that somehow, <laughs> that, that, so all classical music is racist, any, or anything that has any kind of hierarchy, if it's like fields of, of physical forces, that's racist. The, this, this Yule is an absolute madman, but he's beloved in the musicology profession. Of course, they all, Alex Ross loved him from The New Yorker. So Jackson published a symposium in the Journal of Schenkerian Studies that had critical, actually people being sort of cautiously critical of Philip Ewell's bizarre theory of hierarchies and musical analysis being racist. And he was, they, they canceled his program, they canceled his journal, they took him out of policing. He's, he's suing. Uh, so there are suits going on. There's a guy in Florida that's suing. So yes, that's a very good idea. I would, I would, I would actually, though, complicate your observation about COVID. I would say that one of the worst consequences of the racial hysteria in medicine is to say that uh, racial disparities in health outcomes are themselves also the result of racism. And again, you are not allowed to talk about behavior. So you may have noticed that it's not allowed any longer to say that obesity is bad for one's health. We're all supposed to be fat positive and celebrate obesity like this is really good. Uh, and that is, has a racial uh, angle. 
And so the Scientific American has published whole, you have all these medical journals that are devoting entire issues to the, is, the idea of racism in medicine. And they published a study saying that uh, to talk about that we should try and, and lower black obesity rates, that that's racist. And so the, the only allowable explanation for racial disparities in health outcomes is that doctors are racist. What you're not allowed to talk about is exercise, better medication compliance, maybe people need help if you're in a poor neighborhood, get help getting to your medical appointment. But I can tell you, you can talk to inner city doctors that work in big university medical centers, and they will tell you about differences in people showing up for postnatal, prenatal uh, visits and care. There are race differences there. But you're not allowed to talk about that. It's only doctor racism. And that means that we are not going to be saving black lives, because we're not allowed to talk about the behavioral components of race disparities. And I would say that COVID, the obesity, is probably the greater reason for uh, the, the black-white disparities that we saw in, in uh, COVID uh, mortality rates. All right. I'll, I'll, uh ask the final question here as we're out of time. And this is a personal one, Heather. You know, in this book and throughout your career at City Journal and elsewhere, you've, you've written about some pretty upsetting trends in uh, American life. So I, you mentioned you're a pessimist. <laughs> um, I, I wonder what motivates you to keep going. <laughs> uh, sorrow and rage. <laughs> <laughs> My heart is broken on a daily basis to see the things I love torn down with such ignorance. Uh, I, and, and they're not just the things that I love, but so many people love. And um, I can't take it any longer. And I'm, I'm furious at the ignorance that is allowed to dominate our culture and our civilization. Uh, I've, I'm the most privileged person in the world to have had a liberal arts education, the humanities, to be able to have read English literature before I was, before anybody thought to instruct me that I should feel oppressed by reading dead white males. It never occurred to me or to my peers to reject reading John Milton or Alexander Pope or William Wordsworth. Uh, or Edmund Spencer or Chaucer because they were white males. All I knew was that I couldn't understand Milton's syntax in Paradise Lost. And that, that was what felled me, not his, his dead white maleness. Uh, so I had to work very hard at that. Um, but I'm glad that I did. And, and Milton's vision of Paradise in Paradise Lost is one of the most uh, sensually charged acts of, of, of linguistic beauty and accomplishment, of, of utter richness of, of fecundity, that, the world that he describes. I am very privileged that I got to read those books. And it, it breaks my heart that generations that have come after me have been given excuses for their own ignorance. And all they care about is pursuing these fictions of their own victimhood and, and their alleged fragility. It's nauseating. I can't stand it. And we all have to stop being browbeaten into silence by all, whether it's the fiction of fragility and safety, the fiction of racial oppression. We have to start fighting back and fight for our civilization. Well, on that note, uh, I want to thank you, Heather.